Hi everyone, good evening. My name is Rebecca and I am the founder of I Have a Voice, which is a social enterprise that empowers people to engage with politics. And the first question that I ask any new group of people that I work with is, what do you think about politics? Um, and there's often a really diverse range of answers. Um, but more often than not, there's an underlying sense of frustration, um, both in the way that politicians behave and in the way that politics plays out. Um, and I'm delighted tonight that we're joined by someone who is doing something about that, because not only does it mean that people have um, certain impressions of specific politicians, but also it means that they are concerned about the effectiveness of the UK's democratic processes. Um, so Matt is joining us tonight. He's the director of Compassion in Politics. Um, and he's going to tell us all about that, but I'll just tell you a little bit about Matt. So he is a campaign extraordinaire. <laughs> um, he's led a number of social and environmental justice campaigns, and he was part of a Nobel uh, Peace Prize winning team, which is pretty epic, uh, working on the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons, um, which successfully lobbied the UN to do that, to do just that put a ban on nuclear weapons. Um, and more recently, he worked on um, a campaign for the Equal Civil Partnerships, uh, which secured the introduction of civil partnerships for mixed sex couples. Um, so uh, without further ado, let me bring in Matt. We're just making up. Hi, Matt. Hi, uh, hi, Rebecca. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Loud and clear. <laughs> um, so I guess the first question is, tell us all about um, Compassion in Politics. What did it do? What inspired you to set it up? Um, yeah, cool. Well, and thank you very much for having me and thanks for that lovely introduction. Um, so Compassion in Politics, we set up, we launched two years ago. Um, purpose is to put compassion, cooperation and inclusion at the heart of politics. Um, the reason why we did that, I set it up with um, a friend and colleague and we had both worked in political parties and in campaigns for a while and felt that there was a bit of an absence of a campaign basically saying we need to put these values at the heart of the way that um, certainly politics and public life is carried out. Um, so that's what motivated us obviously 2018 it's hard to remember what 2018 was like now uh, given everything that's going on but it was a very very difficult time in politics um, uh, and the debate in parliament was particularly bad uh, politicians were getting a lot of death threats something that continued um, so that's why we launched around then that was what really motivated us to go for it um, now our focus really is on two things i we work on trying to change the processes in politics and in parliament to make it more compassionate cooperative and we also champion and support policies that we see as being about bringing more compassion into um into society and into politics in general so you know we sort of say you can look at across a whole range of issues refugees dying at sea in the channel trying to make a better life um homelessness poverty and if it was just approached by politicians from a perspective of compassion things would be a lot different so um that's that's us that's what we do and uh, um yeah we've been going about two years yeah what so you mentioned then a couple of, of examples where if there was a compassionate approach to politics it would look different what does compassion in politics look like what would we see on the campaign trail what kind of policies would mm. we see what do you see when we tuned in Prime Minister's question time? <laughs> <laughs> great question, great question. I mean, I guess maybe it helps if I if I divide it between the two areas, as I say, that we work. So in terms of um, the way politicians work or the way that they approach things, our focus is on basically trying to make compassion come first, which means putting compassion ahead of party lines. It means... Um, uh, Yes, a respectful form of debate, working on issues, not on uh, personalities, looking to the long term, not just for short term electoral gain. Um, 
it means taking out a lot of the nastiness that you get in debate, calling people, you know, there's so much escalation in terms of the language that's used in politics these days, calling people traitors and acts of betrayal, uh, or, you know, even in COVID, calling for a test and trace system that was world beating, but actually we just wanted one that was functioning and helped save lives. Um, we do a lot of work as well on um, in supporting people like Full Fact, who obviously want to see just much more evidence-based discussion in politics, taking away the drama and the theatre of it. Um, in terms of in Parliament, I think that's a really interesting thing that, you know, for you to raise, because we one of the problems that we have is just with the way Parliament is set up at the moment. So if you look at Westminster and then mm -hmm. compare it to any other debating chamber, really, it's, it is in a microcosm such a strong example of the way that politics is done quite badly. You've got two mm -hmm. rows of chairs. They rise up deliberately on one side of each other. So it's like, you know, the, it, it's a sort of like the bear pit. Um, they're against one another rather than circular. Uh, mm -hmm. They're deliberately designed to be two sword lengths apart so that they can't quite um, draw swords and stab, stab each other. But if you go to other parliaments across the world, they're, yeah, they're circular, they're all on the same level. Um, they sit and listen. They don't jeer or boo. Um, and although, you know, a lot of people say, oh, it's tradition, it's great theatre, it's actually incredibly off-putting. Most of the mm -hmm. public, when they're surveyed, don't like what they see going on in Parliament. Um, and it's very off-putting for people who want to become MPs. No one really wants to go into that kind of chamber and try and raise their own point of view. So that's... Um, a potted sort of air exactly of how politics would be done and then in terms of policy it's it's raising the voices of people who aren't traditionally heard putting in basic protections and safeguards so um the uk is quite unique in not having basic socioeconomic rights um that's quite jargony but what we that basically means is that we do not have a particular right to avoid going into poverty um <laughs> most other countries have adopted uh, a United Nations decree on that from 19, from the 1970s, but we haven't. So we want to put that in place because we think that's the very basis of a compassionate society, that you don't let people fall through the gaps like that. Um, but as I said, also looking forward, looking to the future. So compassion is, um, the reason we chose compassion is because there's loads of work done on it as a form of therapy and as a way that you can community build and, and bridge divides. Um, and it has a very rational basis and you need compassion if you're going to try and do things like stop climate breakdown because you need to be able to think about future generations you need to extend your compassion beyond just your immediate peers um so that's why we brought that in and we're trying to bring in that sort of culture in the way that political decisions get made so it's not just about how do we look populist today it's like how do we leave a legacy for tomorrow that's brilliant and great to be thinking like further ahead um as well and definitely something that um, engenders long-term thinking, which is often missing from the political debate. You mentioned yeah. um, a UN, was it a declaration around poverty? Ah, um, so the UN, and that's a, so yes, it's a United Nations um, convention okay. on, uh, on economics, culture and society, or something like that from around 1976. And yeah, the UK has acknowledged it, uh, it says, you know, supports it in principle, but um, has never implemented it. And actually a lot of the, uh, if you look at Philip, say Philip Alston's report on the, on the, on UK austerity, which became hit headlines a couple of years ago, was it last year? Um, which basically said, you know, that the welfare state has been torn up in Britain and things like that, uh, referenced this fact that he said it's very regrettable that the UK has not implemented any, the, you know, basically this convention which says you need to create socioeconomic rights and there's lots of evidence that countries that have that have a much more committed program of policies towards alleviating poverty uh it's very strong correlation uh scotland and wales uh it should be mentioned uh, honorable mention because they, they do a lot better on this scotland's got a fairer scotland duty wales has future generations commission um so they're sort of ahead on these things. Um, so it's a case of trying to get England sometimes to catch up, which, um, but sadly doesn't always necessarily go down that well with um, English politicians, if you put it in those terms. So um, 
but those examples exist and they are they are doing much better yeah that's so interesting i had i hadn't realized that um, it's really interesting like policy lever that's not being used um, mm. in the same way um you also run um an all party group um compassionate politics can you explain who run what what that is kind of their standing in parliament how that operates yeah sure so um an all party group so every um, politicians can basically, elected politicians in Parliament can set up um, all party groups. Um, the only requirement being that they are cross party mm -hmm. uh, and that they are chaired by an MP. Uh, so you, if you can look up the register of all party groups, and there are many. <laughs> so we have joined a big sea of all party groups, uh, from football to beer to country issues to to many things. So one of the things that comes up about them is, well, what can they really do anything? You know, if you can have it, it's, it's relatively straightforward to set one up. And it all comes down to basically the membership and who you've got on your group and whether they're particularly active and committed because they can do incredible things. Or, yes, they, they can be sort of good excuses for a social. Um, so we're really lucky. We've got uh, Debbie Abrahams MP, the Labour MP for Oldham East and Saddleworth and Baroness Varsi. Mm. conservative member of the house of lords who are co-chairs and they are just phenomenal people fantastic to have as co-chairs so active so committed and then brilliant members people like caroline lucas mp uh tracy crouch mp the bishop of durham uh alf dubs who's you know uh, just such a wonderful compassionate person so lots of really great people who i'm now forgetting to mention <laughs> Baroness Lister, uh, et etc and and so what we do, so what that does is, I mean, the group can decide what they work on themselves. And then they, and so that's what they, you know, they come up with a program and their focus for the coming year is going to be on creating an enforceable, new enforceable code of conduct for MPs, mm. uh, which we can talk a little bit more about mm. and why they want to do that. And then looking at uh, ABBGs can run inquiries. So in the new year, we're going to run an inquiry into how the welfare state has responded um, or not to COVID uh, and do evidence gathering and come up with a report and recommendations. So, but I mean, just in general, the purpose of an APPG really is the fact that it's cross party. You can organize behind the scenes and sort of share information, ideas. It can be very solidaritous being a member of an APPG. And I often think of it also like, I sometimes say, if you want to see really good politics working in Britain, which can happen, um, <laughs> watch committee hearings like they can be very dry and quite long but the mps on those committees they really are well briefed they really know what they're talking about and they work together across party and i think a similar thing happens with the appgs it's the sort of politics that sometimes the media won't sh some of the media won't show because it's not quite as exciting as them tearing each other apart uh but it is more much more constructive and detailed and um informed yeah, um, I definitely find them a useful forum. And you would, when you're at an all past parliamentary group meeting, you wouldn't know that the MPs in the room are all from different political parties. Exactly. Given the yeah, room. totally. Yeah. That you interact with one another. It's very collegiate and collaborative. Um, and yeah, they're friendly. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's so weird. Um, yeah. Um, you, you mentioned the code of, of conduct. Mm. Um, can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, sure. So there is a, um, there's the raft, actually, of sort of... I'll, actually, I'll take a bit more of a step back. Um, there's, a, there's this idea of parliamentary sovereignty, which has been used quite a lot <laughs> in the media and, as a term. But one of the crucial things that means is that parliament is actually responsible for its own rules. Uh, mm. So there's this idea that Westminster should be separate and MPs should decide how parliament gets run, debates get run. Um, and I think that's led us into quite a dangerous situation where often tradition or um, uh, practices that are largely based on who holds power get held sway rather than actually very basic principles about how you should run an organisation, a business, w whatever. Um, so they, that's been a very big problem recently. There was a report that sort of highlighted the fact that MPs, offices, when they employ staff, they can do that on their own terms. There's no one overseeing that. So it was described as basically being 650 private offices or private businesses, 
there being 650 MPs. So I'm sort of saying all that basically just to give the background, which is that um, the parliament runs itself. It's quite isolated from the way that other organizations run or are expected to run. So our goal is to come up with a much more up-to-date, rigorous, enforceable, strong code of conduct for MPs and to do that with advice from external organisations, people like ACAS and CIPD, who do this every day and set standards that have not yet been applied to Parliament. Um, and in doing that process, to offer training to MPs to say, you know, <laughs> um, because a lot of MPs, they want to know how better to behave towards one another their staff or they want to know what the sort of rules are around HR procedures and guidances so to use it as a learning process for them as well um, the thing that is going to be hard is making it enforceable and parliament is very um, resistant to change of course so we have to we're working on engaging people like the speaker of the house of commons Lindsay Hoyle who's you know who's been very open to speaking to us about it um, to uh, other things like the committee on standards to try and get them to adopt what the MPs come up with. So at the moment, we're in the process of developing it and consulting and talking to them about, you know, the very real things, because a lot of these codes can be drawn up in a theoretical sense. Um, mm -hmm. And obviously there's some things, principles that just have to be there, but you also have to understand what their life is like and what's going to make the difference and what do they realistically think can be changed. So that's, mm -hmm. we're having those conversations at the moment. It's so interesting. Like it's, it's an issue that, um, has needed addressing, in my opinion, for, for a long time. And you've mentioned back to 2018 being kind of a bit of a piece. Mm. Both the major parties have had headlines this week linked to a lack of compassion in politics, yeah. whether it be bullying or anti Semitism. I think it just highlights how pertinent an issue. Mm. <laughs> totally. And I think, I think when you look at those things, it's um, obviously it's very, uh, it can be very demoralizing, which is. Um, yeah, totally understandable. But it can also be very confusing because you kind of think, well, how can people sort of behave so what seems so badly or so, um, you know, aggressively, as is in the case of the Home Secretary, towards other people? And I think, you know, we try and base what we do on a lot of the sort of psychological research. We're, we're um, very lucky to work with people like the Compassionate Mind Foundation, or should give a shout out to, um, who do amazing work or share a lot of amazing work on why do humans act in certain ways? How can we encourage them to behave better and to bring compassion and empathy and sympathy into their work? And I think there's a few basic things about politics, which is particularly bad. One is clearly that there's a power basis. You know, it's incredibly hierarchical, lots of power concentrated in Westminster. Um, and to get to a position of being a minister, you have to do, you've got to put up with a lot of stuff and you're going to develop a very hard skin and become desensitized to the way that you affect other people just as much as the way that they affect you i think secondly is is about the party politics and compassion politics are not around to get rid of party politics but clearly once you start putting people in tribes and in groups that ups the ante um and and creates a lot of aggression uh, and then particularly within our system as it is uh as i say with the, the whipping practices the fact that we have a very basically a two-party system which pits two groups of people against each other and that leads to more sort of black and white thinking um so those are the things that we kind of see the processes that we see leading to the sort of behavior that you've been talking about so and that is exactly why we try and bring this research to try um and change it yeah there's so much more behind kind of what you see and it's so interesting to hear how like the the our history impacts it still and like how systemic and and how the system doesn't really engender itself to not at all and um so we've done so we've as i say i actually you know mentioned compassionate mind foundation and um so Professor Paul Gilbert, who I'd recommend anyone looking up his books, um, he's absolutely terrific. He's written a paper very recently, which is coming out soon, which is essentially <laughs> this incredible, uh, he's taken basically the whole of human evolutionary history 
<laughs> and sort of said, and this is why we have problems today in our politics, our society, our economics. And it is terrific. I mean, it, it's, I can't summarise it all here, but it, it, you know, it is about how hierarchies get changed and enforced, how once people get richer, they tend to get more selfish. Sadly, that is a very common trend. They get more narcissistic in their behaviours. Um, and all, none of that is to say, you know, they're evil, they're bad people. But we've got to understand those evolutionary psychological roots if we're going to address problems that have been around for a very, very long time. But unfortunately, our political system seems in particular to be very resistant to changing and acknowledging that those problems exist. And as, and as you say, I mean, we all carry those problems, but politics, my God, it ups the ante so, so much. Yeah. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions about yourself, but I thought rather before moving on from um, passion in politics, what's kind of the light at the end of the tunnel? What's like, you obviously like have a sense of <laughs> what's like the hope and the, the thing that you're like, okay, this is going to happen and this is good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wow, that's on the spot. Um, I mean, I think for us, just the, 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 the willingness of MPs and, and members of the Lords to engage with us um, mm -hmm. has been amazing. And, you know, the ones that we do work with, they're so committed, they're so energised, they really want to change this. So I think that's it. I think, and I think also other organisations that we work with, supporters that come forward wanting this, um, you know, and peop people really do believe. And, and I think even in this last year, we've seen some really bad decisions, some really some, some, some tricky you know moments but i think also you know it has been a year where people really have um changed behaviors and whether or not they're good or bad in some respects it doesn't matter it just shows that you can that things can be changed and people will change brilliant thank you um a lot of people who i have a voice interacted they're um aspiring campaigners so i wanted to ask you <laughs> a couple of questions about your experience because mm. um, you've worked on some really important campaigns, like I mentioned in your intro, um, the Nobel Peace Prize, Peace Prize um, team and mm. the Equalities work. How do you decide what campaigns you're going to work on and lobby for? Um, and then I guess what made you pick the particular campaigns that you picked and what made them important to you? Yeah, I was I was thinking about this before and I d it's one of those things where you look back and you probably rationalise a very clear decision <laughs> that was actually made at the time on <laughs> nothing like it. Um, I, um, I mean, it's, it's, I think what I have, ex what I can say is that I've experienced working in campaigns where you know that you are there doing a job, but it's not actually something you're fully engaged with um, on an emotional level. And I think that's how I've decided. I, I'd always, you know, so taking the ICAM anti-nuclear campaign as an example, and I, I think there's a chance that uh, one of my colleagues from, from those days is out there, so I should give a shout out to them as well, Rebecca. Um, but we, um, uh, that's just something that, since I was at school, I just could not believe that nuclear weapons, can, that people would make such things of destruction. So when an opportunity came up to work there, I was absolutely going to take it. On the equal civil partnerships, there was another reason actually for taking that role as well, which was that, um, I it seemed like something that could be changed you know <laughs> anti yeah. the anti-nuclear weapons thing was like uh, massive obviously and, and I signed up n never necessarily thinking that it would be as successful as it has been and that was down to lots of amazing people doing brilliant work who weren't me um but the equal civil partnerships thing was really exciting because I was also thinking this seems so obvious it surely should be changed and could be changed um and that really enticed me as well so i think you know and sometimes you need that as a campaigner you need to, to work on something where you actually there is change delivered and you need that to sustain yourself um but that i mean that is the, but otherwise i would say just those values that the value alignment has always been the thing for me or has increasingly become the thing for me as i say i've worked sometimes and you just know that it's not making your heart beat that bit faster um and that's the thing that helps you decide that's really interesting and, and great actually that you um demarcated kind of the big picture thing that you thought was really ambitious but you're like i want to give it a go because it's so important first yeah. it's something that you're like this is this is feasible because when i'm working with young people that's what i try to get them to do i'm like okay you've got your big picture you want to stop climate change what can you do that's going to empower you and enthuse you to keep going like what campaign can you create or support that you're like oh, okay that could happen that makes perfect mm. sense that 
kind of be a thing within the next year. Um, and I think, I mean, I think it's so important for people to be able to have that opportunity to sort of win at something, but also strategically for a campaign. So compassion politics, you know, we've got this grand lofty aim of bringing in socioeconomic rights, but we're going to have to win other things along the way. We, we, we can't just focus solely on that. We've got to be opportunistic and flexible because A, we need validation. B, supporters will get bored and tired. Uh, we need it as well. Um, and also you can't put all your eggs in one basket. You've got to find ways to deliver change outside of just that one original plan. Definitely. That's such great, such great advice and words of wisdom. I guess building on that, do you have a top tip? For us? <laughs> um, I think, um, well, I actually was thinking about this in terms of like, if for people getting involved in campaigns, what would be looking back, what would be my lessons that I'd learn? And I mean, I'm still learning every day and making hordes of mistakes, I'm sure. Um, I think get lots of different experience. So that was one thing that I did purely by chance, but I sort of tried campaigns, I tried strategy, comms, and I love that, um, you know, some people really want to specialize and that's totally fine and cool. I, I liked doing lots of different things because then you can try your hand at them and, and learn from them. I think try out play, different places as well. There's so many different types of campaign from value-based to single issue to, you know, uh, to ones that are built around the charity that they work for and different types of organisation from big and structured and, um, you know, will have very clear goals over three to five years to other ones where it's much more flexible uh, and both have advantages and disadvantages. So try out different ones and meet lots of people. And obviously at the moment, Zoom with lots of people um, because, and I'm not particularly great at that. I have to, that's, that's something where I know that I have to work on it. Um, but I... Uh, sort out a couple of mentors when I started out in campaigns and they really really helped just meeting up not with any particularly formal structure but just talking about what they had done um, they helped me with a couple of sort of career decisions but also knowing that you can change your you know those decisions nothing sets you on one particular path there's always going to be lots of opportunities to try out different things so don't don't worry if you feel a bit stuck in a rut at one particular time because things will change uh, sometimes with things like covid they'll change because of nothing that you can control sadly so um be open to those opportunities when they come up that's really sound advice for those people who listen who are thinking about a career in public affairs what mm. what you mentioned campaigning strategy and communications or comms what what is the difference between those yeah. mm. Yeah, sorry, that's really good. Um, and also public affairs and press and so on. So I, um, I wouldn't necessarily pretend that I know fully the difference. And I don't think many organisations always do. That's some, But I think there's, I found that there's a few core common elements that most campaigns will have. So they'll have a policy person who will know the intricate and that's for very detailed people who can with brilliant memories, um, who who can decipher lots of quite complicated documents and things like that so, and do the research then there's normally a sort of comms person who might do uh who might cover press and social media and also writing you know copywriting and things like that um campaigns though um i started out more just focusing on campaigns and that was literally the sort of how are we going to take these policy ideas and organize in a way that then hopefully delivers them and that could be parliamentary lobbying um, on the ground, getting community groups involved in the grassroots um, uh, and, uh, you know, also pulling together the other elements of the social media and the press and so on. Uh, and then I would I would pass over to you, Rebecca, for the public affairs side, because I wouldn't pretend to be an expert in that. And I think that is your background, right? Uh, more policy than public affairs, but yeah, okay, okay. Um, public affairs, yeah, I would say it's it's campaigning focused on parliamentary processes. Mm. So how you use the different levers within parliament to affect change and really That's focus on that. Much better definition than I could have given. To, yeah. <laughs> um, I've had a question from Kajal. She's one of our youth mm. ambassadors. Um, and she's asked, how did you get into this field of work? Was it through a politics degree or something else? Ah, yeah. So I, um, <laughs> I, I did do a, I actually did history for my undergraduate 
uh, which is the classic, like you can't really decide exactly what you want to do. And I, I mean, obviously, if you want to go into history, then that's what you do. But I was sort of, I wasn't that sure. So I did history because I liked it. Um, I did do a public policy masters. If I'm honest, I wouldn't say that was an essential. <laughs> Again, I did it partly because I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Uh, it was at a time, um, and it saddled me with quite a bit of debt. So it's one of those tricky decisions. Um, I got into it though. So I then went and did a year. Um, I started out doing a graduate scheme and I hated it. It was really not for me at all. Um, it, and it wasn't in campaigns. It was, um, I won't name the company because that would be unfair and it probably isn't there for, it just wasn't for me. Um, but it wasn't anywhere where I wanted to be working. And so at that time in the evening, and I know this this is a privilege that I had and that other people might not. So I've got to acknowledge that, but I did some voluntary work just for free uh, in the evenings with a couple of campaigns who needed, who were very grassroots and just needed volunteers, people to do stuff like occasionally write a press release or turn up at a demo um deliver some leaflets stuff like that and that just got me involved got me talking to different people from that i then signed up to mailing lists i read about different campaigns i got in touch with some talked to them uh and then it meant that when a job opportunity came up that i wanted to apply for in campaigns i at least had some experience um that was it though i did yeah um when i sort of suddenly realized hey why am i doing this um, graduate scheme I need to be doing I just yeah signed up to a couple of mailing lists and, and took it from there I think the mailing list is like such a undervalued but such an important part of finding your way into a new field because it's through identifying the newsletters where they tell you what's going on like events the actual job opportunity mm. like newsletters are, are fundamental it's one of those things that you don't really know what newsletters exist until you're in the field of already so to encourage someone to look and ask someone okay i'm interested in this field what, what do i need to sign up to to make sure i'm keeping up to what, up to date with what's going on and opportunities to meet others um it's such a useful question so casual i suggest you ask <laughs> someone. yeah um, and actually, and yeah like, identify a couple of the people in, in that area so i think what mm -hmm. i i did when i was starting out i i can't really remember how i I got involved, but the campaign I got involved with was um, Move Your Money, which I don't think is around now, but it was about encouraging people to move their their money from uh, less ethical banks to, to more ethical banks. And I, that was just something I really, really wanted to um, to be involved with. So I think I must have just been doing some Googling and basically sort of took it to email. I think email people, like I always say, just try. Yeah, um, It really, people tend to really like being contacted and asked for their advice, uh, but also really want to take on people who can who can help them out. Um, if you can be quite specific in doing that about what you want to offer, why you like them, they'll very often find a role for you. Compassion in Politics tries to do that as much as we can, because um, we know what it's, you know, uh, both of us, Jennifer and I know what it's like when you're trying to find your way in campaigning or in you know community action or whichever branch you want to go into brilliant thank you great question Carter. Um, yeah great question um i just have one final question unless anyone quickly wanted to ask i'll give a couple of seconds um, no um so my final question is quite straightforward um but can you finish this sentence mm. i have a voice I, um, can I check? <laughs> That's not my answer. When you say I have a voice, do you mean um, the organisation? Or do you mean uh, finish the sentence I have a voice as in I, yeah, can you just tell me a tiny bit more what you I should person, aim you at? So you, you have a voice, like you personally, think I have a voice, how do you use it? How would you like other people to have a voice? Got you. Got you. Okay. Do you want to try saying I have a voice again? And we can pretend that this didn't happen. <laughs> can you finish this sentence? I have a voice. I have a voice. Um, and so for me, um, it's about trying... I don't want to be sound as... I'm trying to avoid sounding cheesy and this sentence is already far too long. Um, <laughs> but um, to be as kind and compassionate as you can. Because I think 
for us, that's actually, and, and that's actually quite a hard edged thing for us because that's where we see change starting to happen. I, there's, there's lots of structural things that we've got to change, but the way that individuals can make the, the biggest difference is just in how they then approach and, and talk to and deal with other individuals in their community. And we've got to model a different way of clearly politics isn't working particularly brilliantly. The economy is not serving us and the needs that we have. Um, and we can model something different. And, and, and I think that's where, where it can start. And we always say that, you know, compassion can be a very radical act in, in a world where you're taught to act quite differently to other people. Sorry, that was multiple sentences. That was a brilliant answer. Um, and it definitely wasn't cheesy. It is something. <laughs> thank <laughs> you. That's great. Um, thank you so much. I really Pleasure. appreciate Pleasure. Thanks for having me. Talk to us. Um, yeah. And have a nice evening, everyone. Um, and speak to you Thanks soon. Thanks all. Thanks for watching. <laughs>